My name is David Cobb. I like to say that I am a proud, I am a patriotic, and these days I'm a pissed off American citizen. And I use those words very carefully, folks, because I'm also a political progressive, but I think that we make a mistake in the progressive community by allowing the Tea Party to claim some sort of monopoly on political anger. Because if you talk to a Tea Party supporter and ask, well, why are you angry? What's really, what's motivating you? What's going on? And I've done this. What I have found almost universally is they'll describe that they are angry about the fact that Wall Street America and the big bankers destroyed the economy and then were rewarded with a trillion dollars of our tax money. Well, you know what? I'm angry about that too, aren't you? And every progressive I talk to is angry about that. And I am, think that we make a mistake if we allow the Tea Party to be the only place where that anger is expressed. Because I'll go further. As a progressive, I'm also angry about the fact that one in six American families are living below the poverty level. Don't hear that anger expressed at Tea Party rallies. I'm angry about the fact that one in four children are going to bed hungry or without enough food to eat. Don't hear that anger expressed at Tea Party rallies. And I'm angry about the fact that the large transnational corporations are basically destroying the planet that we depend upon for life itself and creating a racist, sexist, and class oppressive world order with the plunder. And I certainly don't hear that anger expressed at Tea Party rallies. See, the point I'm making, folks, is I'm, I think that we need to get in touch with the idea of our anger because the anger that I'm describing I think that's a righteous anger. And I use that word very carefully. You see, righteous anger is a unique type of anger. If you get angry because you don't get your way, that's not righteous. Righteous anger can only exist if your anger has been provoked by unfairness, injustice, oppression. But honestly, if you get angry about those things and you don't do anything about it, just sort of stew and wallow in it, that's not righteous either. Righteous anger requires action. You have to get involved. And saying it that way, righteous anger fueled the abolitionist movement of this country. People were angry at the unjust, depraved institution of slavery, and they acted. Righteous anger brought those women together at Seneca Falls to stand up against the patriarchy and launch the women's empowerment movement. Righteous anger was behind the trade union movement, behind the civil rights movement. Righteous anger is a good thing. And if we actually allow ourselves to act out of our anger at the injustice, work towards justice, we'll discover joy. It's an amazing thing what happens. You don't just stay angry about it. You have to be provoked by your anger at injustice, work towards justice, and it'll change your entire emotional, psychological experience. And I also want to say this, folks. I'm also a sad American because I can remember a time in my life when I could say that I was a proud and patriotic American and I didn't need any other qualifier. For me, that's when I was a little boy. When I was taught that I was from the United States of America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. But more importantly, I was taught that the United States of America stood for liberty and justice and equality. And I was so proud of that. And not only that, I was taught that the, my country was like some great shining light on the hill and that we were going to guarantee liberty, justice, and equality to the entire world. What a wonderful thing. And I'm angry and I'm sad because I grew up and realized I had been lied to. But you know what, it's not the kind of lie you normally think about. So instead, let's say I grew up and realized I had been subjected to a creation myth. Uh, that, that this idea of how America operates is not how it really operates, but I had been convinced of it. And the reason that it worked on me, the reason it works on you, the reason that that creation myth works is because we want to believe it. See, we want to live in liberty, justice, and equality. And I'll tell you this, folks, not only do we want it, but we deserve it. It's our birthright. And it's our birthright not because we're Americans. It's our birthright because we're human beings. You bet American children want and deserve liberty, justice, and equality. And so do Iraqi children and Afghan children and Israeli children and uh, Lebanese children. You know, children all across the world want and deserve these things. And so the point I'm making is that the movement that I want to be part of needs to understand that we really are a human rights movement and that we've got a sense of solidarity with the folks who are struggling in North Africa and in the Middle East and in Latin America. There's a democracy movement happening in this country and it's something very exciting. In order to really understand how we can shift the culture in which we live, we should acknowledge it's going to require a lot of work 
and it's going to require us to be really persuasive. Not to persuade people that we need to make change. The reality is that if polling data shows overwhelming majority of Americans believe we need systemic change, what we have to be persuasive about is that there is a plan, that there is something that can be done. Here at Move to Amend, I'm going to lay out what our plan is so that we can actually move forward. But I just want to point out, people already agree with us on the need to do this. We have to persuade them that it's possible. And so since we have to learn to be persuasive, I want to be clear about something. Something I knew inherently, intuitively as a trial lawyer, but now science is proving beyond a shadow of a doubt. And that's this. If you want to be persuasive, facts don't matter so much. First time I heard that, like you, Bill, the first time I heard that, I thought, oh, no. I've invested a lot of time and energy in learning facts. And, you know, I was really concerned about that because, you know, I thought if you just learned facts and learned how to present those facts, that then you would be able to persuade other people. But what George Lakoff and other cognitive scientists have proven is, really, you have to understand and how to be an effective storyteller because we understand the world through the stories we tell each other. Individual facts, we process those facts in light of whatever story we already have about how we understand the world. There's a cultural story. There's an American story. That creation myth is something that lots of people know. So here's the point I'm going to say, folks. Since, it's, since we know that we have to be persuasive, since we know that at the end of the day what we're talking about is the need to persuade people, we know that stories are what animate and move people, I'm going to tell a story. I'm going to tell a story on how it came to be that not just that large transnational corporations are exercising power, I'm going to tell a story on how it came to be that large transnational corporations are ruling us. As surely as masters once ruled slaves, as surely as kings once ruled subjects, Unelected and unaccountable corporate CEOs are ruling us because they are making the fundamental public policy decisions that affect all of our lives. Corporate CEOs have already decided what our transportation choices will be. Corporate CEOs have already decided the energy policy of this country. Corporate CEOs already decided what kind of health care you're going to get, or for most of us, what kind of health care we won't get, even if we need it. Corporate CEOs decide how much poison will be in the air that we are all breathing, how much poison will be in the water that we're all drinking. Hell, corporate CEOs decided whether it is to send this country to war. And we, the people, are left to choose between paper or plastic at the grocery store. We get to choose between Coke or Pepsi. We have 31 flavors of ice cream or 17 different types of toothpaste. At any, like, go to any reasonably well-stocked department store here in Lansing, Michigan, walk up and down the aisles, count them. I guarantee you, at least 17. Now, I want to be clear. I think it's wonderful that there are consumer choices. But don't mistake a consumer choice with political power. You see, real political power would be participating in the decisions that affect your life. And choosing from consumer choices that are presented before you, that's a kind of materialism and consumerism. Not saying that it's, it's certainly better to have choices than not, but don't confuse a consumer choice with political power. And so since I'm going to be telling a story, I want to be very explicit. There are four topics that we're going to cover in this little story. The first topic is the word democracy. That word gets tossed around a lot in this country. So to make sure we've got some common ground and a shared understanding, somebody tell me what language the word democracy is from. It's from Greek. Very good. Let's break it down. Demos means? The people. Kratia means? Kratia means rule. So literally, the word democracy means the people rule. Quick pop quiz. How many folks believe we, the people, are ruling in the United States? Don't be shy. Look around. Look around. There's not a single hand in the air. I do this presentation all across the country. Sometimes I do an afternoon and an evening presentation. Sometimes I talk to 30, 50, 75, 100. In Traverse City, I talk to 400 people. I ask that question everywhere I go, and nobody ever raises their hand. Folks, that's a problem. But saying it another way, I say that's a good thing. What? It's not a good thing that we the people don't rule, but it is a good thing that nobody's raising their hand anymore. I think it's a good thing that we're finally being adult enough honest enough to have a genuine conversation about the fact that notwithstanding the creation myth that we were taught about this country, 
an acknowledgement that there is a plutocracy, that there is a small oligarchy, that there is a small number of people making the decisions for the rest of us. And the reason it's good that we're acknowledging that is because it finally puts us in a position to figure out what to do. Because if you stay confused about how the system works, your response will always be confused. I think it's a good thing that there is an awakening now amongst the American people that there really is a small ruling elite. And that brings me to the next topic, which is the word sovereignty. Folks, honest question. If I just had the word the sovereign on the board, who or what would you think of? The sovereign, quick. King. king. Almost everybody, the, the king or queen. If I say the sovereign, that's the word that pops into your head because that's the story that we're kind of taught culturally. That's because the word sovereignty means the authority to rule. And 500 years ago, the king was the sovereign. The sovereign was the king. Those words were synonymous. Where did the word, and where, by the way, did the king claim his authority to rule? God. You don't get more legitimate. Right? I mean, think about it. If, if you've got the right to rule from God, that's a big deal. And to, to illustrate what I mean by that, we're going to do a quick little exercise together. This exercise is always a lot of fun for me. You'll see. I'm going to invite this, this group to, to just for a moment close your eyes and repeat after me. David Cobb is the king. <laughs> and uh, uh, let me try something else then. Uh, because David is our absolute ruler. Um, last one. And therefore, anything David says must be obeyed without question. <laughs> okay. So, you know, I, I would normally, this is when I say, okay, open your eyes. But to your credit, Lansing, nobody's eyes are closed. That's a good thing. The second thing I'll observe is you all did what every group does. As soon as you realize what I was asking you to say, not only did your eyes pop open, but y'all kind of chuckled at me. Did y'all hear there's that kind of snickering and laughing about it? Like, not only were you not going to say it, but you thought it was funny. And by the way, the reason you thought it was funny, if you ask any comedian, they'll say, like, it's not like I made some sort of witty and droll comment. I was like, oh, that's so very, very witty, David. That, that, that's so good. No, no. That my humor was a very base humor. If you ask a comedian, she or he will say, well, yeah, that's absurd humor. You set them up. You said some. You said something so absurd that their only reaction could be laughter. Because to say that I get to tell uh, Roman how to live his life because who my parents are, or even better, that I get to say how all of society is going to be organized because of the divine right of kings, that's ridiculous, right? That is absurd. Of course you laughed at it. And 500 years ago, people just like you and you and you and you, we not only said it, but we believed it. Folks, I want to stop for a moment and underscore the question of sovereignty, the question about who has the authority to rule in any given society or culture. This might be one of the most important first principles questions that a group ever makes. You know, look, I'm a Green Party member and I'm proud of that. But I'm also proud to say that I've worked in respectful coalition with Democrats very frequently. I've even worked with Republicans on issues where we have common ground. When it comes to the NDAA and the, the uh, Patriot Act and other such issues, I've worked very closely on civil li liberties issues with Republicans. I've also worked with socialists and anarchists. I've worked with uh, moderates. I've worked with uh, any number of people. I say that not so you'll pat me on the head. I say that so you'll appreciate what I mean when I say in my 25 years of effort to make social change and look for opportunities to be in coalition, I've never had the privilege or the opportunity to work in coalition with a monarchist. In 500 years, that's all there was. The idea, when people tell me we can't make changes like amending the Constitution, it's too hard. I think, have you not been paying attention? The level of changes, the degree, the depth of changes that have been made in this country. The point is this, folks. If you want to make change, understand this. All it takes... Look, here's reality. If enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true... It's true. It's true. This is the point. Honestly, that's really all it takes. And if it is true that the United States of America is fundamentally racist, sexist, and class oppressive, and it is, 
then we ought to be thinking differently. We ought to be acting differently. We ought to actually start acting as if we have the power to change it because we do. That brings me to the next topic, which is legal personhood. Please note that on the board, it did not write corporate personhood. That's because the idea of legal personhood means the ability to assert rights. And in this sense, folks, I mean, if you can assert your rights under law, that's a way to think about personhood. Saying it this way, isn't it obvious that the fight over who gets to be a legal person has been one of the fundamental fights in this country? This is not a trivial matter. This is not like a legal technicality. The question of who has the ability to assert rights under our system has been one of the fundamental political, cultural fights that has had to take place in this country. It matters. And the last concept on the board right now is the corporation. Since that word is equally important, I'll ask the same question. What language is the word corporation from? It's from Latin. Let's break it down. Corpus means body. And now for extra credit, the suffix T-I-N, it means the state of or to have or create. So literally the word corporation in Latin translated to have or create body. And in this sense, I mean literally physical body. Because in law school we are taught that a corporation does not exist. However, we will pretend like this group of people and the material and the resources and the contractual obligations, all these concepts, we'll pretend like this abstraction is one thing under law so that we can treat it a certain way under law. And remember, if enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true, it's true, poof! A corporation is a construct because it is created culturally under law and society. And the reason the word corporation comes from Latin is because the first corporations ever created by the genius of human creativity were created during the Roman Republic. Not, by the way, during the Roman Empire. And sometimes I wish we spent more time asking, what happens when a republic devolves into an empire? Because that might be an important conversation in the United States. Think about it. But the point is, the Romans created corporations for a reason. And, for example, y'all heard the phrase, all roads lead to Rome? That Roman road system was designed and built as a corporation. Likewise, the aqueduct system that moved water all across the Italian peninsula without electricity. Humans are clever, but that aqueduct system conceived of, designed, and built by a Roman corporation. Likewise, the first universities, the first hospitals. Can you guess? Corporation, corporation. Point I'm making? Think about it. The idea of the corporation, every time when they were first created, what does a road system, a water system, a university, a hospital, what do they all have in common? Every single thing I've just said serves the public interest or a public good. The genius of the idea of a concept of a corporation is to take private money on a material basis and put it to public use, but to do it on a voluntary basis. In other words, you don't compel it. You say either as a nonprofit, would you please give me a donation? Or if it's for profit, even you say, would you please invest in it? But it's always voluntary. Saying it that way, I want you to understand, I think the concept, the idea of the corporation is brilliant. This is a brilliant way to be able to organize resources and material and so forth. David Cobb is not anti-corporation. The Move to Amend Coalition is not anti-corporation. However, we are against corporations having constitutional rights, which is a different idea. Now, I just want to point out something here, folks. This is not exactly how the modern transnational corporation operates, is it? That's because the modern transnational corporation actually comes out of the 14th and 15th century of Europe. You know, the age of discovery. And what did the Europeans discover in the 14th and 15th century? Africa, Asia, later North and South America. Newsflash, there were people living there. They weren't lost. They didn't need to be discovered. And so, in the spirit of truth-telling and honesty and courage, let's just acknowledge that the 14th and 15th century of Europe was actually the age of rape and pillage and plunder and murder. For me, there's one word that sums that up. It's the age of empire. And see, that's what imperialism means. It means beating people down. It means killing them. It means stealing their resources. And check this out. The modern transnational corporation did not just accidentally get created during the age of empire. 
The modern transnational corporation was intentionally and deliberately created as an instrument of empire. I mean, one of the most early of the corporations, they were called joint stock companies at the time, and one of the very earliest and most famous of those joint stock companies was the East India Company, literally designed to facilitate the military destruction and conquering of the entire subcontinent of India so that they could force those people to go to work stealing the resources from their own land so that those resources could be shipped away to Europe as profits for the shareholders of the joint stock company known as the East India Company. Another of the corporations or the joint stock companies was a little outfit known as the Africa Trading Company. Would anybody like to guess what the Africa Trading Company traded? Good, you know what, good for you folks. I'm so glad to hear that word come out because I'm now gonna use myself as an example and I'm not proud of this, but I think it's important for white people to be honest and to actually have honest conversations about race. For me, if I'm being casual or kind of lazy in my thinking, if I just say, what did the Africa Trading Company trade? The word that'll pop into my mind, unless I'm really like trying to really be thinking, the word that pops into my mind, slaves. The Africa Trading Company traded slaves. I mean, because that's what I was taught in my textbook in history, you know, the African slave trade. I was even taught to revere Harriet Tubman, the runaway slave, who helped other slaves escape. You know, uh, and by the way, I'll never again ever use the word runaway slave. I think that we should actually think of those people as self-liberated human beings. Words matter. Stories matter. But the point is, the reason I'm using myself as an example is because I'm trying to have an honest conversation about how our culture works. Because after all, now that I've made such a big deal about that word slave, was Africa populated by slaves? No, Africa was populated by people. And listen to this, folks. Africa was populated by people who were basically just like me. Now, I say that with full awareness of my pigment. I know I'm white, I'm not stupid. And so I say that with some trepidation, but I also say it with conviction, because if you ask any scientist, if you ask any biologist, she or he will tell you race doesn't exist. I mean, yes, skin pigment clearly exists. That's obvious. Anybody can look and physically see that. But so does hair color, so does uh, uh, pigment in the eyes. You know, the point is that that exists, but no scientist would elevate those trivial distinctions to a taxonomy or a classification. So no scientist would tell you that race exists in that sense. But check this out. Race doesn't exist, but racism damn sure does. How can that be? Remember, if enough people think that something is true, if enough people act like it's true, it's true. Point I'm making, race is a construct just as surely as the corporation is a construct. Social constructs matter because it's how the culture is operating and there's a reason for it. Just like the, the reason for the corporation was to do certain things under Roman times, I will tell you that the reason that race got created as a construct was to justify slavery. Now, I'm not going to say that the, the idea of the corporations created slavery because slavery had pre-existed that, but that slavery was different. For example, let's say that uh, Roman and I belong to different tribes and there's a river that separates my tribe from Roman's tribe and my tribe goes to war against Roman's tribe and my tribe wins this war and by the way, why, what, what are some reasons why my tribe, what, what are some reasons why one tribe might win a war against another tribe? What are some reasons? Better resources, that's a good one. More people, that's a very good one. Those weapons, weapons better weapons, those are the three that almost every group immediately comes to. More people, more technology, better weapons, or, or otherwise resources. That's always the, the top three reasons that every group always says. But of course, I haven't given you enough information to know why my tribe wins the war against Roman's tribe. I haven't given you enough background. Shall I tell you why my tribe wins the war against Roman's tribe? Because I'm telling the story. See how important stories are? Think about this, folks. It's very important that we ask ourselves, who's telling the stories that we're listening to? What are their motivations? That's very helpful if we actually dig a little deeper and think about those things. Unfortunately for you, Roman, I am telling this story. So I win the war. My tribe wins the war. I put my spear up against Roman's throat and I say, Roman, you're now my slave. Let me ask you all something. 
What is the philosophical, intellectual justification for David to enslave Roman? The spear. Power, nothing more. The point I'm making is that race got created during this time period in order to justify the utterly outrageous, on its face, stupid idea that one can justify the enslavement of a whole group of people on something as really relatively trivial as skin pigment. Another point I'm making, imperialism, corporatism, racism are inextricably linked concepts. And what links them? Oppression. A dominating oppression. And I'm not the first American to say that because a, one of the great American orders of all time said basically the same thing in what I believe is his best political speech. It's not this fellow's most famous speech because his most famous speech is I have a dream. Who am I talking about? I have a dream? Martin Luther King Jr. And that's a famous speech and it should be. But I'll tell you, I don't think that's King's best political speech. I think King's best political speech wasn't delivered in Washington, D.C. King's best political speech was delivered in Harlem, specifically at the Riverside Church. And in that speech, it's also known as Beyond War or Beyond Vietnam, King said, the United States of America is suffering from a spiritual and moral decay. Remember, King's a man of faith. This is strong language. The United States is suffering from a spiritual and moral decay, King says, because of the triple evils. Again, strong language. The triple evils of racism, militarism, and extreme materialism, or just old-fashioned greed. And King said, the United States can't become the country that we want to be. King says we can't become the country that we deserve to be. King said we can't become the country that God intends us to be unless and until we, we address those oppressive systems within our own culture. And you know what? King was right. He was right then and he's right now. And since I finally got around to America in my story, I told y'all I was going to tell a story, right? Here's a quick little question. How many colonies in founding the United States of America? 13. That was a gimme, y'all. Everybody knows that one, right? 13 colonies. So here's the real question there. Of those 13 colonies, how many of them were corporations? Nicely done. It was a trick question, but the answer, all of them. Every one of those colonies was a corporation because it took the king to create each one. Because the king had to give body to each one of those. And the king gave body to each one of those by the use of a very particular legal instrument. Do you know what that legal instrument is actually called? A charter. And to illustrate how a charter is used to create a corporation, and especially how the king did it to create uh, those colonies, we'll do another little exercise. In this exercise, I'll be the king. Why do y'all think I might be the king? Because I'm still telling the story. That matters. So I, the king, will now create Massachusetts. But I'm not going to bother with the day-to-day -day affairs of governing Massachusetts. I've got, I'm the king. I've got other people to rape and pillage and plunder and murder from. Apparently those are kingly duties during this time period. So instead I will assign a royal governor and assign that royal governor the task to plant, to rule, and to govern this new area on behalf of me, the king, to benefit me, the king, but also the royal governor must benefit the shareholders of the joint stock company known as the Massachusetts Bay Trading Company. See, Massachusetts began as a for-profit corporation just like the East India Company, specifically designed to vacuum out the resources of this land and send them to the shareholders in England. So too, the Providence and Rhode Island Plantation. Virginia was called the Virginia Company. Georgia was a penal corporation. Quick quiz, you know what skin color most of the original slaves had who actually worked the uh, Georgia Penal Corporation? White. I'm telling you folks, white people especially have to get a handle on what race is as a construct and why the ruling elite created it in order to pretend as if for working class white people just having some pigment actually means anything. Right? It's a really ridiculous idea and it's how the ruling elite like try to convince 
poor downtrodden white people, hey, at least you're white, as if that really helps or matters anything, even as they're oppressing uh, economically. I'm telling you, the construct of race is something that we, need, we sh in this country should delve into more often. Now, another way to say this, folks, is that the American revolutionaries were not calling for a more socially responsible king. So maybe today in this movement we can do more than just ask for more socially responsible corporations. Maybe we can raise our aspirations a little higher. Maybe we can actually think about ourselves differently. Because we know that the American revolutionaries succeeded. We know that the king gets thrown out and a new charter gets used to create this system. To, to, to create the supreme law of the land. What's that document called? Nicely done, the U.S. Constitution. Folks, how many here in this crowd have actually read the Constitution? Be honest. Lots of hands go up. So y'all grade my papers, okay? In other words, I'm going to lay out how I believe the Constitution is supposed to operate. See if this makes sense according to how you understand it. When you read the Constitution, I tell you, you will see two principal actors. The first actor is the most important actor. In fact, it's so important, it's the first three words. We the people. Those are hallowed words in this country, and they should be. See, we the people come together to create the second actor, which is government itself. Saying it this way, we the people create government. Government is dependent upon us. In another very real way, government is a construct just as surely as race or a corporation. See, under this framework, we the people are described as being free and sovereign. Anybody remember what the word sovereign means? The authority to rule. The king is not sovereign anymore. We kicked his butt out. But check this out. Government isn't sovereign either. In fact, to the contrary. Government is subordinate and accountable. Government is subordinate to whom? The people. Government is accountable to whom? The people. That's got a ring to it, doesn't it? I like how this is going. We the people are free and sovereign because we the people have rights. Government does not have rights. Government only has duties. And I want to stop for a moment and really underscore, as a lawyer, to share with you, if I've got the right to do something, it means I can do it and I don't need anybody's permission. I don't need your permission. I don't need the City of Lansing City Council's permission. I don't need the Michigan State Legislature's permission. I mean, thank goodness, given how y'all's legislature is going crazy. But... Uh, I don't need the federal government's permission. Look, I'm from Texas, y'all. I don't need my mama's permission. If I have the legal right to do something, it means I can just damn well do it. And if government tries to infringe upon my rights or your rights, government's wrong, not us. See, this idea of having rights really matters. Government never has rights over the people. Government only has duties. And where do governmental duties come from? Well, remember, all power resides with the people. And this is a very powerful idea. You know, the people have all the power in any political jurisdiction. You know, like, uh, no government is legitimate unless it has the consent of the governed within that jurisdiction. So, the people of Lansing have all the political power. And so, quick pop quiz, what is the population, more or less, of Lansing, Michigan? How many? 100,000. Let's say it's at roughly 100,000. I'll tell you this, I will celebrate that there are more or less 100,000 people here who have all the political power. That's wonderful, I'll celebrate that, but I'll tell you this, I'm not going to go to a meeting of 100,000 people where we decide where to put stop signs. And I like political meetings, but I'm not going to that one. See the idea here, folks? Yes, the people in any jurisdiction have all the political power, but we delegate a certain amount of that power to government. We delegate our, some of our power, not all of it. We delegate a certain amount of power to government. How much power do we delegate to government? Only enough to perform the duties that we have already told them that they should and can do. In other words, this is what a government of limited power means. They're limited in power to perform the duties that we have already said that they would do. And how does government discharge their duties to us? Why they write laws in the public interest. And I want to be clear, there is going to be debate on what kind of law should be passed, and there should be. There's going to be disagreement about that. And that's okay. We should learn how to disagree with one another on particular laws, 
and about how certain things should operate. But the one thing that no law can ever do, no matter how much support it has otherwise, is to violate the private rights of one of the actual citizens within that jurisdiction. For example, Jim Crow segregation laws, even though they got passed, were a violation of the actual rights of people who lived there, those laws should have been able uh, overturned. I'll go you one further, Roman. S SB 1070, this Supreme Court is just dead wrong. It's violating the rights of human beings who live there. The, the, this court does not understand the constitutional framework, does not understand the democratic republic. So you look at this and I think, wow, this is brilliant. We the people are free and sovereign because we hold all the political power, but we delegate some of our power to government, government which will be subordinate and accountable. We will assign government some duties that, and they will discharge their duties by writing laws in the public interest, but the no law can ever violate the private rights of an individual citizen. I look at this and I think this is brilliant. This is beautiful. We should try that in this country. This would work. And I'm not even joking, before, because before I go one second further waxing poetic about how brilliant and beautiful the U.S. Constitution is, I've got to have a quick time out and ask, what year does the Constitution become the supreme law of the land? Anybody know? Nice. Yep, 1789. Good job. 1789. The reason I want the date certain on the board is so that I can ask, in 1789, who gets to be a legal person? Who's part of we the people in 1789? White. Is it all white people? No. White property owners. All the white property owners? Male. Only the male ones. That's a lot of restrictions, y'all. Point is, you know what percentage of the adult human beings actually were legally persons who could actually participate in this framework? 5%. Another way to say this, folks, is that 95% of the adult human beings living in this country were not legally persons. Another way to think about this is the way Howard Zinn said it, which is the entire history of the United States can be seen and understood as a series of struggles by actual human beings to be defined as persons with rights protected by our Constitution. That's so important, I'm going to say it again, probably the most important way to really understand our history is as a series of struggles by different groups of human beings to actually be called legal persons with rights protected by our Constitution. Remember I said legal personhood matters? That's what I'm talking about. It really does matter. And so, if this framework is helpful, and I hope it is, it might behoove us to ask, well, where would a corporation go? I mean, after all, corporations are dominant parts of our culture. Well, to do that, let me tell you what it once took to form a corporation. First, you had to get a bill introduced in the lower house of your state government, and it had to pass by a majority. Then that bill had to go to the upper house, and it had to pass by a majority. And then the governor had to be willing to sign it. It was the functional equivalent of a law. That's how hard it was to get the privilege of limited liability. But I'm not done. Because if you were ever, as you, uh, when you applied, you had to prove a public need that was not being met. And if you ever did anything other than that specific thing, your corporate charter could be revoked for going beyond the authority of your limited liability. And if you were granted the privilege of limited liability, it was only granted for a specific time period, at which point it dissolved. And if you wanted the privilege of limited liability, you had to do it again. And by the way, even if you were in that limited time period, even if you were doing the limited specific thing that you were supposed to do, if you ever violated the public trust by causing harm to the body politic, your corporate charter was revoked. Point I'm making is, folks, there was a time in this country when the corporate chartering privilege was appropriately politically controlled. I'm not saying this was the land of milk and honey. Slavery existed. Patriarchy was real. Workers were oppressed. There was genocide. But what I am saying is the instrument known as the corporation was once appropriately controlled. And so now that we understand that it takes an action of state government to create a corporate charter, we know that that corporate charter can be used to hold the corporation subordinate and accountable. We know that the corporate charter describes the duties of what a corporation can do. We know that a corporate charter should only be allowed to exist if it's serving the public interest. Isn't it obvious that a corporation should go on this side of the line? 
Isn't that just clear? And so, folks, thanks for your patience, because here's the punchline. When the United States Supreme Court comes waltzing in, in an act of supreme judicial activism, says, oh no, even though the word corporation is never used in our Constitution, five of us are going to tell 300 million of you, you now have to treat a corporation as if it's a person with rights under this document, and that perverts this whole framework. See, corporate personhood is not just an illogical legal idea, which it is. Corporate personhood is not just a stupid idea, which it is. Corporate personhood is a linchpin for how the ruling elite have hijacked our government from us. They have hijacked our right to govern ourselves. And what pisses me off as a lawyer, they use the legal system to legalize the theft. They tell us no matter how hard you work for any particular law, some corporate lawyer can just come waltzing in and overturn it. And that's the point, folks. Corporate constitutional rights have been used to overturn environmental protection laws, worker safety laws, public health laws, and most recently, campaign finance laws. So at move to amend, we say, ya basta. Enough already. This is ridiculous. This idea that corporations are ruling us, it's not the way it's supposed to be. It's not the way our government is supposed to operate. But it is true, right? I mean, don't we realize that these huge transnational corporations have basically hijacked everything? Right? So what are we going to do about it? Well, we say it moved to an end. We need to do what the American revolutionaries did, what the women's suffrage movement did, what the civil rights movement did, what the trade union movement did. Movements have to understand they have to drive themselves into the Constitution because that's the supreme law of the land. Any movement that takes itself really seriously has got to grapple with that. And so our demands are simple. The first one is obvious. Abolish corporate constitutional rights, also known as corporate personhood. Another way to say it is only human beings have constitutional rights. Corporations have privileges under law, but they do not have constitutional rights. This is also known as the well, duh, demand. Because it should be painfully obvious, and it is painfully obvious to anybody, corporations are just capital, right? I mean, and, and businesses have least some legal privileges, but no business has the inherent and alienable right of a conscious or a soul or any of those things that is what it makes us human beings. There's just no way for it, right? So we have to abolish this court-created idea, but we also have to abolish the equally odious, also court-created idea that money equals speech. Because this idea has been used to allow corporate lawyers to overturn every meaningful campaign finance law that has ever been passed. And that's the reason that a small group of people are basically financing the entire campaign system in this country. Twelve people accounted for well over half, almost three quarters of all the money spent in the Republican Party primary. So here's the thing, folks. If you would like to join this movement, I'm going to invite you right now. If you are not already part of this, if you're not getting information, I know, Roman, you are, and I think that you are as well, right? If you would like to start to receive information from Move to Amend, I'm going to pass this to you. If you already get stuff from us, that's okay, just pass it. But if you're not sure, sign up. And honestly, if you're not going to, uh, like, if you don't want to join, just pass the clipboard. I won't be upset, I won't be offended. I mean, honestly, I'll be surprised. It's like, you know, but, but I'm just asking you, when you sign up on that, to know this. This is a movement. We're going to be in touch with you. We're going to share your name with other people who are working on this effort, too. We're going to actually be making an effort. We want to start at the local level, get, get other people to uh, work together to pass resolutions, to pass local laws, uh, to get it on the ballot. We need to start thinking of ourselves the same way the abolitionists did or the women's suffrage movement did. We've got to actually be serious about a movement, the kind of movement that it's going to take to take our country back. Peace.